Hi, this is Stephen, and I want to thank you for joining us on this wisdom journey. You can do us a huge favor by subscribing to our channel and liking our page, and that will help more people discover this Bible teaching ministry. You can hit the notification button to be updated whenever we post a new video. And I also hope you'll share these videos with your friends and family. Most importantly, that this study will help you walk in wisdom. Thank you again. On today's Wisdom Journey, we set sail now into Paul's second and final letter to Timothy. Pastor Timothy was one of Paul's closest friends. He was a spiritual son to Paul as well as a fellow worker. Now, chronologically, 2 Timothy is the last biblical writing of the Apostle Paul. And as we learn from this letter, uh, Paul is once again, for the second and final time, imprisoned in Rome. Now, he evidently knows that his court appearance with Nero is going to end with a death sentence. So as he writes uh, this rather tender, emotional, encouraging letter, keep in mind that he is anticipating his imminent death. But let me tell you ahead of time, you're not going to read a letter filled with self-pity or regrets. In this very personal letter, Paul is going to continue instructing and encouraging young Pastor Timothy to just stay the course no matter what. Now, in the opening lines of this letter here in verse 1, Paul, uh, he begins with his rather typical introduction. Remember, back in these days, letters were signed, so to speak, at the beginning, whereas we typically sign ours today at the end. Then here in verse 2, Paul addresses the letter. He writes to Timothy, my beloved child. And with that, Paul reassures him in verse 3, I remember you constantly in my prayers, Night and day, verse 4, as I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. Now, the tears he mentions here are more than likely related to their last farewell. That was perhaps at at Paul's arrest. At that point, they both knew that they would uh, not meet again until they reached heaven. Maybe you've shed some tears recently like that, knowing that your dear friend, uh, your, your spouse, maybe a child or a grandchild would no longer be available for fellowship, for that telephone call, for conversation. You said farewell, knowing that you might not say hello again until that grand reunion in heaven. And to me, this is a reminder for us not to take for granted what we have today, uh, the fellowship, uh, the enjoyment that we appreciate so much with others. I never end a phone call with my wife or grown children without saying, I love you. In my mind, those might be the last words they hear from me until our reunion in heaven. Now, with that, Paul mentions here in verse 5, Timothy's sincere literally unhypocritical faith. Paul describes it here as a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. Now, we know from Acts chapter 16 that these were devout Jewish women who had accepted Christ. Timothy's father was a Greek who had not accepted the Lord. And frankly, this is another reminder uh, on another subject, uh, but important to note here that God can raise up godly children even in the absence of of a believing father. Well, let me tell you, beloved, God is not handicapped by your family tree. He might be using you today to create a brand new branch on that tree of the redeemed who live for his glory. Well, with that, Paul now tells Timothy here in verse 6, fan into flame the gift of God which is in you. Now, this spiritual gift, no doubt related to his pastoral ministry. Now, this doesn't imply that Timothy's sitting around on his porch when he should have been in his study. Uh, The tense of this Greek verb here indicates that, that Timothy was responsible for constantly fanning his gift into flame. Beloved, God will call you to serve him, and he will gift you for his service. But he isn't going to get you out of bed in the morning. He isn't going to open up your Bible for you and put your nose in it. He's not going to cook that meal for you to deliver to a needy family. 
He's not going to make you write that letter to encourage someone or, or outline that Bible study lesson. You must be responsible for the things that you do. That's what it means to fan the flame within you. As somebody told me years ago, even God won't steer a parked car. There are a lot of gifted people in the church today, and their lives are in neutral. So don't be afraid to get moving. Paul reminds Timothy here in verse 7, For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So don't hesitate. Get to work now for the glory of God. Now, the remainder of this chapter can be outlined as uh, Paul's use of the word ashamed that appears several times here in verse 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. Now, you might think, is Timothy ashamed of Paul or of the Lord? Well, there's no reason to believe he is. Uh, Paul just wants to encourage him to make sure that doesn't happen. No doubt Paul sees uh, the pressure. He, he knows the persecution that's coming to the church in fresh waves. It's going to be tempting to stay silent. That's a temptation for believers today as our culture grows more and more hostile toward the claims and convictions of, of true Christians and Christianity. It's easy, it's easy to avoid trouble by just being quiet. The problem with that, of course, is the world needs to hear you. They need to hear the gospel. And Paul sums up the gospel now in verses 8 and 9. As the power of God who saved us and called us, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace. This salvation, verse 10, explains, is through Christ who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light. Now listen, we can't stay silent about the only hope our world has today. Paul has been appointed as an apostle to preach the gospel, and he's suffering because of it. But I want you to notice uh, that he writes here in verse 12, but I am not ashamed. There's that word again. I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. See, Paul is suffering for being a Christian for proclaiming Christ, but he's not ashamed of the gospel because his confidence is in Jesus Christ. So he's effectively saying to Timothy, look, Timothy, don't be ashamed. Don't be silent. Don't be fearful. He now adds here in verse 13, follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me. You see, what Paul has taught Timothy is sound doctrine, and Timothy is, is to cling to it, to teach it uh, to himself as well as to others. He tells Timothy here in verse 14, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Essentially, what he's saying is, Timothy, look, your mother deposited a treasure in you, as did your grandmother, and as I, Paul, did in mentoring you. You've been entrusted with the riches of God's grace, his gospel. Now guard it carefully and, and teach it to others correctly. Now, with that, Paul warns Timothy by bringing up the failure of some who've abandoned the gospel. He writes here in verse 15, You are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phagellus and Hermogenes. Well, these two men were evidently prominent believers, perhaps even church leaders. Paul's reference to Asia is important because that's the province in which Ephesus is located, and that's where Timothy is pastoring. So Timothy is surrounded not only by persecution, but by poor examples of Christians, just like you are today. These people back here in the first century, well, they demonstrated it by uh, being ashamed of Paul. These believers avoided Paul in his imprisonment. He was their apostle, their preacher, teacher, but they didn't want to be associated with them. You know, I think of today, we, we have what we call cultural Christians. Th those are people who like the name Christian, so long as it doesn't bring them any embarrassment, so long as it doesn't demand anything related to holy living. Well, that's taking place here. Paul now provides Timothy with a good example by citing the testimony of Onesiphorus, that's a church member from 
Ephesus. As chapter 1 closes, now Paul writes in verse 16, Onesiphorus often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. Well, there's that word ashamed again. Onesiphorus had evidently gone to Rome. Uh, The church didn't really know where he was. He had to search for him. He finally found the apostle Paul and then ministered to him and stood by him. And he was refreshing to the heart of the apostle Paul. So you can tell in this opening chapter here that Paul is honest about being a Christian, about serving Christ. He's not trying to to paint a pretty picture that serving the Lord is going to get you a lot of friends and win popularity contests. He's telling us, just like he, he tells Timothy here, be faithful, be open about your faith. Don't keep it a secret. Keep pressing on in serving Christ until that day arrives when you finally finish the battle persecution ends, and you see Jesus Christ face to face. Well, until we set sail again, beloved, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.